The Oklahoma Sooners add a transfer wide receiver. They got a wide receivers coach. So many defensive players from the last staff are gone and oh, so close, but yet so far away at Allen Fieldhouse. We'll talk about all of that on today's episode of Locked on Sooners. You are Locked on Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners, and thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. We're free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube, so go hit the subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts and the notification bell over there on YouTube to let you know when new episodes drop. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. You can read my work covering the Sooners over at thesoonerswire.com. He's Josh Helmer. You can follow him on Twitter at JoshOnRef. You can also hear him Monday through Friday from 9 to noon on 94.7 The Ref in Norman. Josh, we've got more transfer portal news to discuss, my friends. We do. The wide receiver, well, one of the wide receiver names that we've had on the radar that Oklahoma's been targeting – announced they're, they're committed Andrew Anthony Jr. Michigan transfer coming to Oklahoma not really a ton of production to Andrew Anthony Jr.'s name but uh just even that one catch and run versus Michigan State I think has Sooner fans pretty excited and bottom line Oklahoma needed some wide receiver help and uh, you know I still think they should be in the market for one more wide receiver ad if they can out of the portal but this is uh, obviously a nice transfer portal ad that we felt like Oklahoma needed to find a way to get done they got it done with Andrell Anthony Jr. So before you kind of get before I get to the the second part of that statement where they need to continue to add another wide receiver let's just talk about Andrell Anthony for a second um not a lot of opportunities for him at Michigan, but a guy that Jim Harbaugh was very high on. I read our our, our buddy Isaiah Hole's uh, article over at Wolverine's Wire uh, when uh, Andrell Anthony entered the transfer portal, and he said that Jim Harbaugh basically said he was his favorite player out of the 2021 re- recruiting class, which that tells you how high he was on that kid, a six foot two, 190 pound receiver that's got the speed to to win down the field. Um, you just look at what he did, just some pro football focus stats for you. Average 17.3 yards per reception, 6.4 yards after the catch per reception with an average depth of target of 17.9 yards down the field, which if that's any indicator, I mean, you know, he had 12 of his 19 receptions were for first downs for the Michigan Wolverines over the last two years, uh, had a little bit more consistent production in 2021 than he did 2022, but you know, it's, I don't know. It's hard to gauge exactly what this guy, kind of guy could be, especially if he was a deep ball guy uh, for the Wolverines and not getting a lot of opportunities down the field in a very run heavy offense. Could he be a little bit more of a difference maker for Oklahoma? Who's going to run more plays and thus throw the football more, but he kind of joins a group of players with the LV Bunkley Shelton's, the JJ Hester's, the Nick Anderson's, the Jaden Gibson's of, kind of a big clump of guys that it's anybody's guess who could end up becoming the starting wide receiver opposite of, you know, Jalil Farouk joining Drake Stoops, who will probably start for the Oklahoma centers in the slot. Um, To your point about maybe adding another transfer wide receiver. I'm, I'm okay with that. I think that's not, not a bad idea. You never want to not add players you think could help you at the same time. I, they have to be like a significant upgrade. Otherwise, you're just adding more and muddying the field a little bit. Like, you got to see what you've got in LV Bunkley Shelton and JJ Hester. You got to see what you got in Andrew Anthony. You got to see what you got in Nick Anderson and Jaden Gibson. You've got, to me, you've got enough of those kind of guys, your kind of wide receiver two types, that you should be able to get one of those to play at a starter's level. So, unless you're adding somebody that is a significant upgrade, maybe, for example, uh, a guy that, like Jordan Addison or a guy like Marvin Mims who had a thousand yard, you know, receiving season looking for a new opportunity wants to come to Oklahoma. If you're adding a guy that just has like a couple years of college experience has a little bit of production, not a ton, but 
is looking for is more snaps. I'm not really that interested at this point. I want to see what we got on campus. And that might be where the coaches go because, again, you've got a ton of guys that you like. Well, you got to start kind of filtering through that and seeing who can who can play and who can play for you. You had too many names, and then it just kind of decreases, you know, practice reps, practice snaps, you know, snaps with the first team that, you know, guys might get in spring ball. So you got to start kind of working through what you got first. Yeah, I'm trying to come up with a full list of how many scholarship guys that Oklahoma has because obviously you're losing both Theo Weiss and Marvin Mims, and you're, you're replacing those two, right, just with the signing class adds alone of Jaquez Petaway and Keon Brown. Now, Oklahoma dating back to last offseason, John, with Jaden Hazelwood out, with Mario Williams out, uh, feels like am I missing a couple of receivers here? Mike Woods is somebody that moved on at the end of last season. So just from the sheer numbers game, I feel like they do have one more that they they could add just to kind of get back afloat in terms of the numbers game. I feel like they're still missing a name or two or a number or two in terms of the wide receiver room. So that would almost be uh, part of my rationale for it. But I, I agree with the sentiment of you don't have to add necessarily just to add. So if – but – Basically, if the, if the staff, if you're in love with Broden, go get Broden, right? If you think that that's somebody that can really big body type wide receiver can add something, a different dimension, be sort of similar to uh, just the physical body type that a Jaden Gibson is because Antrell Anthony Jr. really just flipping on the tape kind of looks like he's somebody, not that he can't go up and high point the football. One of his grabs uh, was actually a really nice climb the ladder type catch, but does kind of seem like that vertical stretch the field burner type catch and run uh, type wide receiver. So Broden maybe of a different type of body type wide receiver. So if Oklahoma feels like they need that, then, Hey, go get it. But I I'm with you. I mean, I don't think you have to add just to add, so to speak. Yeah. It, it, it makes sense to continue to add depth because you still got to hope that Jalil Farouk takes a step. You got to hope that Drake Stoops is at what he was this past year or takes another step forward. And then hope that one of those guys that we've already talked about emerges and becomes a legit wide receiver two for you. Again, it's, it's hope and hope is not a plan. You, you might hear a football coach say it if you haven't, or a, a commentator say it, hope's not a plan, but you got to figure it out. You know, if you don't have reps for those guys because you have too many bodies then it's going to be harder to, to sift through it a little bit and figure out who's going to be a player for you. But the guy that's going to be making kind of the call or being a big part of making that call at wide receiver is now Emmett Jones. The Oklahoma Sooners hired a new wide receivers coach, uh, stole him off of Joey McGuire's staff over at Texas tech. It's an interesting guy. He's played, he's coached at the high school level, had a really nice successful run at South Oak cliff as the head coach was the wide receivers coach at Texas Tech for a time, at Kansas for a time. And to me, the most notable thing for him was he, he was a big part in the recruitment of Eric Ezukanma from Texas Tech, a guy that was really, really good over the years for the Red Raiders and a big part of Sir Roderick Thompson's um, recruitment as well, the running back at Texas Tech. So just a couple interesting names to throw out there. With Ezukanma, I mean, he wasn't there for his whole tenure in Lubbock, but he was there kind of the, the 2018 season, I think maybe in the 2019 season. So a little bit part of that development for him who turned out to be a really, really good player for the Red Raiders. I just love the DFW recruiting ties. I mean, more than anything, the, uh, the talent that he's coached the national football league, you know, there's Antoine Wesley and three others, Dylan Cantrell, uh, Derek Willies and TJ Vasher are all guys that were coached under Emmett Jones that found their way, whether it was undrafted or drafted into the national football league. But look, he's, we think right. Generally speaking is going to be coaching more talented wide receivers in large part at the university of Oklahoma. So I'm not super concerned with maybe what the development side looks like yet, or just the sheer number of guys that have, or have not gone to the NFL. I mean, four uh, at Texas tech is not altogether anything to be, too upset about just considering again, the talent there versus sort of the average talent at the university of Oklahoma. 
I'm fired up, though, that from 2001 until the South Oak Cliff uh, High School stint that you talked about ended in 2014 for 13 years. This is somebody that, as a coach, was very, very involved with the DFW area. So that's clearly an area that Oklahoma is going to continue to mine. Historically, that's been arguably the most important recruiting grounds for Oklahoma. And here's somebody at the wide receiver uh, coaching position, John, that has all sorts of relationships, uh, basically a decade and a half of relationships. Plus you mix in obviously the Texas tech, uh, coaching stint and the Kansas stint there where obviously he's still fostering, nurturing those DFW relationships. So from that standpoint, I love it. Yeah, it, it makes sense if you're going to move on from LD Washington to go after a guy that's got big time ties in a premium market which is the Dallas Fort Worth recruiting um, area. You know, you, you got to like Oklahoma's really good right now in the Southeast with what they got in Todd Bates, Miguel Chavis, Brent Venables, uh, Brandon Hall to an extent. DeMarco Murray is really good, you know, recruiting the West coast. Bill Beanbow can just kind of seem to recruit everywhere. Uh, so you, you feel really good about that. You just didn't seem to have a guy that was, a legit difference maker on the recruiting trail in North Texas. Uh, yeah. You got Jackson Arnold. That was kind of a Jeff Lebby, you know, um, get, and maybe he's kind of your guy in North Texas right now, but then you add another guy in Emmett Jones that gives you a little bit more cachet down there in, in North Texas. I mean, it matters. Like it matters to have guys that are connected, especially to a school like South Oak cliff that just won a state championship. Like that's, that's a big time program, but it, it's spark, you know, go, it spreads, uh, to the rest of the Dallas Fort Worth, you know, Metroplex. It's one of the premier high school football hotbeds in the country. And so if you can get a foothold in there because you've got, I mean, you're going to be still contending with the heavy hitters in all of college football, but now you've got a guy that's got relationships that help get you in the door and get you in parents' homes, get you on the phone with recruits. It, that all matters. I thought this was pretty good from, you know, Brent Venables, of course, in a hiring situation, uh, had his release on what Emmett Jones will add to the program. And Emmett Jones released a statement him, himself to the media. And I'm going to read the second paragraph, at least a portion of what Emmett Jones released. This is Emmett Jones. He says, quote, Oklahoma expects championships. I want to be around champions and I want to win multiple championships. I've coached in a couple of games in Norman and the game day atmosphere is incredible. Even going back to my time as a high school coach, players in our program got really excited to be recruited by Oklahoma. I remember how our, our guys would really perk up when they received information from OU. Just having a chance to be a part of that is like a dream come true. And in order for me to leave Texas Tech, I felt the situation would have to be perfect for me somewhere else. Oklahoma fit. It answered every question, crossed every T, dotted every I, and it's not far from Dallas. It was a no-brainer, end quote. So, again, the the DFW connection here I think is a big, big puzzle piece, John, but I, I get it, right? Everybody always wins the press conference. Everybody always, for the most part, wins the statement that gets released when they're hired. But there's something about just, you know, even beyond just the acknowledgement of, hey, Oklahoma wins championships – they expect to play for championships. I love what he said about recruiting, uh, you know, back in the day that his players would be fired up to be recruited by Oklahoma. So he understands that angle to this. So that should, I think, really, really excite Oklahoma fans. Yeah. And uh, just another note on that, like he had a big part in Texas Tech's passing offense. He was the passing game coordinator for them. And Texas Tech had a really good year. Uh, throwing the football. I mean, we saw what Tyler Shutt could do against Oklahoma's defense this past season, and it was pretty remarkable um, just what they were able to do with several different quarterbacks, you know, running running the offense. I mean, the Texas Tech Red Raiders were 12th in the country in passing yards per game at 305, uh, completing, you know, 61.2% of their pass attempts, um, you know, two TDs a game, and they average 34.2 points per game. So this is a guy that also brings a little something to help the offense improve. And you can't hate that. Anything that you can do to make your offense better, that's a good thing. So we'll see how it all you know transpires and plays out and who kind of benefits the most as spring ball goes along. But I like the hire, a good addition for the Oklahoma Sooners. Coming up, we're going to talk about 
the previous coaching staff and the defensive talent that's walked away. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, Oklahoma's unfortunate loss at the hands of the Kansas Jayhawks. But first, let me talk to you about Bet Online. It's the fastest and the easiest place to bet on all your favorite sports. Um, right now, the Oklahoma Sooners, they are plus 6,600 to win the national championship in 2023. So 66 to one right now to win the national championship. They're tied with the Texas A&M Aggies and just behind Utah TCU who are plus 5,000. The favorites to win the national championship, according to bet online, the Georgia Bulldogs at plus 300 Alabama, right behind them plus 600 followed up by Ohio state and USC. So if you want to get in on some NCAA futures actions, go to bet online. Again, the fastest and the easiest place to bet on all your favorite sports. You can bet on college football. The NFL playoffs are coming up. Major League Baseball futures, NBA, NCAA basketball. It's all there for you. Again, bet online where the game starts. So, Josh, let's just talk about that real quick. Oklahoma plus 6,600. Even if you're one of those people like myself who likes to find those kind of value bets, those deep, deep bets. Like last summer, I think I took a flyer on Hendon Hooker at plus 5,000 um, over at Bet Online, And that was looking re- to win the Heisman. That was looking really, really, really good uh, for about 10 games of this season. I was like, Hendon Hooker, Hendon Hooker rubs hands. And then kind of the, the wheels fell off, um, you know, a couple games. And then he got injured and wasn't invited to the Heisman ceremony. But uh, yeah, if you're, even if as, as a value better, I don't feel great about Oklahoma, even at plus 6,600. No, I'd be curious. Do we have conference championship futures yet or strictly the 2024 college football playoff national championship odds? Uh, you know, I, I don't like Oklahoma at the 66 to one to win the national championship because simply put, I don't think Oklahoma's winning the 2024 college football playoff national championship. I, I though do think it's within the realm of possibility and not altogether crazy that Oklahoma can win the big 12 championship, be either a one loss or undefeated big 12 champion and be headed to the college football playoff. So just based on those numbers right there, that Oklahoma is 66 to one right now. And I think they opened 40 to one and then have fallen to that point. So they are kind of going the opposite direction. The fact that they have those odds, John tells me that, well, obviously there were in our big 12 teams that have better odds than Oklahoma to win the national championship. That means that you've got, I think some pretty appealing odds for Oklahoma in a future number in terms of winning the big 12 championship. So that would be where I'm looking at because I do think there's a really, really good chance that Oklahoma is going to win the big 12 championship. There's nobody else that I just, I, you know, Texas, a lot of people like Kansas state uh, because of the return of Will Howard, people uh, feel pretty good about, but I'm not just absolutely in love with either of those two. So I'd be looking Oklahoma's direction there. Yeah, right now the third best odds to win the college football playoff national championship next season. So we'll probably land somewhere around there to win the Big 12 uh, when those you know Big 12 conference futures odds come out for bet online. And yeah, you're, I think that's a good bet like to, to put on Oklahoma because I think they'll have a chance. Like you mentioned, nobody that's going to be like far and away better than what Oklahoma was. They're, you know, Texas, they're going to be a favorite. They're probably going to be the favorite going into next season, but they also lost Bajon Robinson and they're losing some, you know, key pieces off of their defensive line. DeMarvian Overshone, a huge piece of their defense is going to be gone. That that matters. That stuff is going to matter for, for Texas. One note that you kind of brought up in post show, I'm going to let you take this away because you found it is a good note from, uh, you know, uh, a good Oklahoma Sooners and really just college football follow out there. Blatant homerism. Uh, Alan Kenny, who also does some work for uh, Crimson and Cream Machine and Athlon Sports, had a, a really um, intriguing tweet that we're going to discuss here in just a second. Yeah, I don't know that I have uh, just verbatim the tweet in front of me, but basically with David Aguebu's decision to enter the transfer portal. Here, here we go. I do have it verbatim now. By my count, David Aguebu is the 13th defensive player recruited by OU's previous coaching staff to enter the transfer portal in the last two years. So 13 defensive players have entered the transfer portal from the previous coaching staff uh, for Oklahoma. Uh, he continues, so far two have transferred to Power 5 programs, one of whom 
was a grad transfer to Stanford. That, of course, would be Pat Fields. The other would be uh, Latrell McCutcheon to USC. I think there's a chance that David Aguebu could be the third Power mm-hmm. 5 transfer out of uh, these defensive players for Oklahoma. But it does, John, I think, give us an indication that, number one, there's been some legitimate turnover here, right? Some reshuffling of the roster at Oklahoma, which we knew, but that sort of puts the numbers into perspective a little bit for us. 13 defensive players have, have gone in only two of which so far have landed at another, another power five program, which I think you can come away and say that Oklahoma's coaching staff kind of got the roster reshuffling, right? In that respect. I mean, if there aren't, a ton of other power five suitors out there. What does that tell you other than, well, the evaluation from the previous staff probably wasn't right or the development for the previous coaching staff probably wasn't right. And Oh, by the way, Oklahoma needs to get some players in there that are going to stick and be death pieces or be impact players and stick around Oklahoma. So I, to me, I read that and I say, you know what? That's, that's positive for Brent Venables in Oklahoma as they continue to John reconfigure this roster. Yeah. So much of what, has to happen for Brent Venables is getting versatile, fast football players. And, you know, David Aguebu, you were a really great sooner while you were here. Thank you for sticking around during the coaching transition and being a part of this defense this year, but he's not the fastest player. And in a multiple scheme in which they want their team, their defense attacking and playing fast, it, at times he just didn't fit and that's, that's okay. Like there, there are defensive schemes where he will be a fit. It just, and again, he had a solid season for Oklahoma, but I think it was kind of a you know round peg square hole sort of a situation. Not to say he couldn't, you know, he wasn't effective, but you look at this defense again, it was one of the worst in the country. You got to have turnover at a lot of spots and you're going to, you brought in a lot of guys to the transfer portal who we talked about um, yesterday, Deshaun McCullough, Jacob Lacey, Trace Ford, uh, Rondell Bothroyd, Reggie Pearson, and I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody. Oh, Davin Sears, and then if you want to throw Kendall Dolby in there as a you know JUCO addition, you're you're making a lot of you're trying to turn over your defense pretty quickly with all those transfer portal additions. David Guaybu just wasn't in the cards anymore, and you're and Brent Venables is trying to kind of find an identity with all these additions. So. It's not too surprising. I mean, we're seeing what Alex Grinch has become. Um, I think he must have just caught lightning on a bottle one year at Washington State because, like, he did okay at Ohio State for a year, but then for some for some reason he was from Ohio State to Oklahoma, um, and it never really took hold at Oklahoma. And now at USC for one year, and it's looking like that might be his only year at USC. And so, just things aren't really working out for, for Alex Grinch or for some of the players that may not be as talented as some of those NFL guys, like your Nick Bonito and Isaiah Thomas and Brian Osamoas, you know, guys that were highly recruited, highly regarded players, but either like you mentioned, misevaluated or misused or underdeveloped um, at Oklahoma. So turnover is not a bad thing. It's inevitable every season, every off season, but in this situation with Oklahoma's defense in particular, you got to find talent. You got to find talent that can play right away because you got to get your defense better if you hope to improve from a six and seven season. Well, and we think that Oklahoma's went and got one of those guys out of the portal in Deshaun McCullough, which maybe the writing on the wall was there as soon as that addition was made. The, the interesting thing here is just from a production standpoint, Oklahoma's losing its second and third highest tacklers this season to both David Aguebu and Deshaun White. That's 200 tackles that Oklahoma is losing 13 and a half tackles for loss four sacks. And yet the majority of the fan base, John, I think feels like, yeah, but this kind of paves the way for Deshaun McCullough, who you went and got to come in and be a star player at Oklahoma. Okay. This paves the way for a Jaron Canick, for a Kip Lewis, for somebody else, these young linebackers to step in and get their chance to be difference makers at Oklahoma. I- I'm not saying that that's a, uh, wrong i don't think it is i think it's an exciting time for ou but it's just kind of a fascinating it's a fascinating fork in the road we find ourselves at when the perception is that and yet oklahoma is losing a lot of production and experience in terms of those two and i think that's why we saw danny stutzman go to bat 
for David Aguebu. I mean, this is a legitimate difference-making player for Oklahoma. I know that probably we can get into maybe with a McCullough and, and with a Canick, the ceiling is higher, and ultimately that's where we're all trying to get with Oklahoma, right, is a higher ceiling and an end result that's not six and seven. But just, you know, I mean, Danny Stutzman defended David Aguebu, his teammate, I think, for a reason. Well, and I'm sure he was a great teammate. And I'm sure like he was one of their better players on this defense. That's fine. But the defense wasn't good enough. Like being being one of the better players on this defense, what does that really say? I mean, it doesn't say a whole lot when you're giving up 30 points per game and you're one of the worst in the country. So eventually you got to start turning over players. You got to start adding talent and raising the talent level on the team. Um, again, Aguebu. Great dude. I, I got to talk to him last year at OU Media Day. He was a good dude. I really enjoyed my conversation with him at Oklahoma Media Days last August. Like nothing about the player, the person, and even really the player. Some, like I said before, just sometimes it's just round peg, square hole. It's just not as good of a fit. And that's okay. He's going to go out. I mean, remember, this guy had Alabama offer coming out of high school. So he he's a, a really well thought of player. He's an athletic player that can make a lot of plays. And he did make a lot of plays for the Oklahoma Sooners at times. It's just this season, I think the defense and really the defense as a whole just got overexposed. And so as we go into next year, my hope is that you don't have three players with over a hundred tackles because that just means they're not on the field as much. Like I don't want my defense, you know, having that many guys making that many tackles because tackles can be misleading. A tackle counts the same if it's at the line of scrimmage as it does 10 yards down the line of scrimmage tackles can be a misleading stat. Um, So give me a defense where guys are making fewer tackles in a totality, because hopefully that means they're getting off the field more and they're having to play less plays. All right. Anything else we want to talk, say on, on the defensive part before we turn to basketball, Josh, I just think in closing with all of that, again, look, uh, I just to a small degree here, defending Aguebu a little bit, because I do think, to some degree, he's getting a little bit of a bad rap from the Oklahoma fan base on the way out after, again, a triple-digit tackle season. I get it. Yeah, I hear what you're saying that, you know, not all tackles and production is created equal, but this is someone that played a lot of football for Oklahoma and was a solid player. Look, is he the greatest player, the greatest linebacker in OU history? No, but it's a substantial depth loss, I think, for OU. But at the same time, it's exciting. And in the overall picture of Oklahoma football, the 13 players from the previous staff on the way out and in with the new is a positive for Oklahoma. It's, it's, it's all ultimately a net positive in which David Aguebu well. I think wherever he resurfaces, that'll be, uh, that'll be interesting to follow. Yeah, he's going to have a chance to be an impact player wherever he goes because it's hard to find linebackers with his experience and his production. So good luck to you, David. Hope you land in a good spot and have a chance to compete at the highest level. Turn into basketball, the highest level of college basketball. Uh, the Oklahoma Sooners went on the road to Lawrence playing an Allen Fieldhouse, a place they hadn't won in 30 years. And the streak continues. The Oklahoma Sooners led by as many as 10 points with just over five minutes to play. The Kansas Jayhawks went on an 18-4 to run over the final five minutes of the game to pull out the win, 79-75, to Josh. Man, it was such a a bummer of a loss and very kind of reminiscent and characteristic of their first two uh, big 12 losses uh, to I believe Iowa state and Texas where they had a chance to win those games, but they couldn't close it out late. Same thing happened in this one. They had, you know, again, 10 point lead they had a five point lead um, after CJ Nolan makes uh, hits a bucket. And then it's just kind of all Kansas at that point, man. Uh, It just stings because it's been so long since you've won there and the impact of beating a number two Kansas on the road. If there's quadrant one, two, three, and four wins, John, this would be like quadrant zero win for Oklahoma if they could have gotten it. I mean, it's like this one win alone almost gets you into the NCAA tournament if you don't totally implode the rest of the way. But alas, that's neither here nor there. Oklahoma, even though, look, a lot of folks are going to talk about the 39 free throws that Kansas shot and the 30 second half free throws that Kansas shot it, it you know 
as much as you want to make it about it was a ref show, and I do think at times it was, as sometimes it is in Allen Fieldhouse for the the incoming uh, opposition. Man, you did so much right. 13 minutes of game time, you held Kansas without a made field goal. And in the five minutes, for whatever reason, Oklahoma just can't get that one or two baskets to go win this game. They put themselves in position to do it and just couldn't go find that basket. So frustrating. And I thought this was really good from Eric Bailey. He, uh, I'm just giving him credit. He's the one that sent this out. So close, so many times in six of the last nine trips, John, to Allen Fieldhouse. KU 85, Oklahoma 78 in the 14-15 season. Oklahoma led that game 71-69 to with 345 left. Of course, you had the Buddy Heald game, right, where Heald goes off for 46, three overtime thriller. All you need is one free throw from Kadeem Latin uh, at the final moments there, and, and you're leaving a winner. It doesn't happen. You're losing three overtimes. 70-63, to Kansas in 16-17. Oklahoma led 56-47 with 8-24 to play. 63-59, 2020-2021. OU you led 57-56 with two and a half left. And then, uh, obviously, tonight and then last season, Oklahoma lost there 71 to 69 led 70 to 69 with 17 seconds left. So it's just like, ah, the ghosts of fog Island field house are real. Why, why can Oklahoma not win in this place? It, some places are just like that. I mean, it's that, you know, Joey made a point um, at Oklahoma's last home game about the home environment really being underwhelming. And tonight's loss to Kansas shows you just how impactful a home crowd can be because that home crowd, once Kansas started kind of putting th things together and going on their run to close the gap, you know, from being down 10, the place was erupting and it was going nuts. And that had to make things really, really difficult on Oklahoma. I mean, their shot selection down the stretch, whether it was Tanner Groves, I mean, they missed three straight three pointers there in the final few minutes, CJ Nolan, T Tanner Groves, and Grant Sherfield, Sherfield's shot in particular was just a bad, a bad shot. Uh, Tanner Groves had a wide open three and just missed it. And that's kind of what the crowd does for you is kind of puts you in situations where you're probably not making the best decisions because just the stress of the game and the tension of the game, the crowd is adding to that. And you, you might not make the best decisions. Oklahoma didn't shoot the three ball well, and but they yet they kept going after it. They kept going for it as opposed to doing what Kansas did when they weren't shooting the three ball. Well, what were they doing? They were getting to the basket and yeah, maybe the refs were calling a lot of fouls, but when you go to the basket, you get rewarded. If you go to the basket frequently, you're going to get rewarded. Same thing happened to the Dallas Mavericks in the 2006 finals against Dwayne Wade. What did Dwayne Wade do? He went to the basket and he got rewarded by going to the free throw line. Same thing happened for the Jayhawks. Oklahoma shot 23 free throws. That's really good. They they were really good from the free throw line. But when there's a 16 foul shot disparity, that's huge. And if you're not shooting the three well, it's really hard to make up the difference. So go to the basket a little bit more. Maybe you get to the free throw line a little bit more. Maybe you end up winning this game. So, yeah, it, it's, again, tough place to play. You know, Oklahoma played a good game. It just couldn't close down the stretch, which has kind of become the characteristic right now. They got to figure out a way to close these games where they're leading late in the second half. No doubt. Uh, they, they played, by and large, given the venue, a great game, John. And, and the frustrating thing is it's almost like, well, yeah, so what? <laughs> because it's been 30 yeah. years. It's been 30 years since you've won in that. Just this particular game in that building, there's a part of you that's kind of like, yeah, they played great. But but they, they really did play great. And that's a terrific Kansas team. And Oklahoma did a lot of great things in the game. And big picture, having won at Texas Tech and then flipping around and almost beating Kansas, now you return home versus West Virginia. Then there's a road trip to Oklahoma State. Those feel both like winnable games now because of the way these last two games went. As much as we can uh, bemoan some of the, the closing here at Allen Fieldhouse, ultimately – you know, Sherfield going and getting you 25 in Fog Allen Fieldhouse and some of what Jalen Hill did. And I thought Milo's Uzon did some really nice things at times. So because of some of these positives, these last couple of games, the arrow is in fact pointing up for Oklahoma. It's, it's tough for me as a fan to feel that way because this loss just stings so much, but it really is big picture for Oklahoma, a good sign. Now they got to go pay it off. Got to return home versus West Virginia and get that uh, win against a team that I think you should beat. Yeah, I think maybe I'm I'm feeling more down 
on it just because when you have the loss to Sam Houston to start the season and then you let one like this slip away, it just hurts a little bit more, you know, because like this is the one that could have erased that one, you know what I mean? Or erased the Iowa State loss um, or the close loss to Texas. Like this, this kind of covers up a lot of your sins um, as a basketball team when it comes time to deciding whether or not you make it into the NCAA tournament. Oklahoma didn't have enough of these last year, enough big quality wins last year. So now they're going to have to go on a run in Big 12 play and prove that they're one of the you know top four teams in the Big 12 before you get to you know, Big 12 tournament time or top five teams in the Big 12. Because as things stand now, they're one and three in the Big 12. They're 10 and six on the season. And yeah, again, a big statement win against Texas Tech. But now you got to start stringing things together. You got to put things together. Yeah, you, you, you know, dropped a, a disappointing one against Kansas. But if you can go, you can beat West Virginia, beat Oklahoma State, and start putting them together, stacking wins together, it'll, it'll look a lot better when you start getting towards the, the postseason. So, again, I, I, I agree with what you said about Milo Suzan. I think he's really become a, becoming a player. And credit to Porter Mosier for getting him involved and getting him in the lineup because earlier in the season he was just kind of, you know, getting spot duty off the bench. Now he's a part of the starting rotation, and that's huge. Like, to see you know, Porter Mosher making that adjustment and getting him on the floor more, getting the ball in his hands, letting him operate the point, I think that's going to help Grant Sherfield a little bit, and it, and it provides a little bit of diversity for their offense. Um, not They can't just sit there and attack Grant Sherfield with traps and then you know expect Oklahoma's offense to run like it should. So you got multiple ball hander, handlers. That should help the Sooners as they move forward. Yeah, and I mean, look, he played 35 minutes then, uh, 35 minutes in this game. Milos uh, Uzon did so. They uh, they clearly trust him, and let's see, he had just the one turnover. So I mean, that's he and Sherfield combined two turnovers in this game. Eleven turnovers for Oklahoma in Fog Allen Fieldhouse, which man, probably you're signing up for that most every time when you go there. Unfortunately, Kansas only turned it over six times themselves. So just uh, frustrating they couldn't win there, but. Big picture again, I think mostly positive. Yeah, and not to uh, – I want to turn it back to football for just a second. Milo Suzan playing well as a young player. This is why you play young players is so that they can build confidence and get opportunities. And as you need them later in the season, they've got that experience earlier in the season that can help you later in the season. So, again, credit to Porter Mosier giving his young guy a chance. It's paying off. I think the same thing could be said for Bajan Cortez. They played him part of the rotation last year, got a lot of experience, and now he's a big part of the rotation this year uh, for 2022-2023. So best of luck, Oklahoma, when you take on West Virginia. Get out to the link on Saturday at 11 a.m. to take on the Mountaineers. Help Oklahoma. Let's create a big, big crowd environment. You're not doing anything else on Saturday anyway. So let's get out there, represent Norman. That's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Sooners. Thanks so much for tuning in and being a part of the show. Make sure you're subscribed to the show wherever you get your podcasts and over on YouTube. Hit the notification bell over there to let you know when new episodes drop. Leave a comment, leave a like, go over to Apple, leave a five star review for us. Help other people find out about the show. Follow us on Twitter at Locked On Sooners. Follow Josh on Twitter at Josh on Ref and myself at John Nine Williams. And until next time, we'll catch you then. Boomer Sooner.